Happy Thanksgiving, by the way. Hope you had a good uh, Thanksgiving last week. I was grateful for Jim Black to step up and step in to preach that message last week. Uh, it was really, really interesting. So um, I w- we were with family, and the passage was, you know, what you heard last week was John 15. And I was like, who, who do we need to hear from? And the Lord drops in my heart, Jim Black. And it was really interesting that he said, I was just going to let you know, hey, when that passage comes up, would it be okay? The Lord put a, a, a pass or a message on my heart for that passage. I'm like, well, do I have a deal for you? And... <clears throat> That worked out well. So I'm grateful to him. I'm grateful for uh, strong men and women who are with us, who are helping to guide us, to lead us, to participate in the glories of God here, to help us become more like Christ. And so we are blessed that way abundantly. And if you need to be discipled, if you want to know more about Jesus, if you want to grow in your faith, there are wonderful people here that will walk alongside you as you are reading scripture, as you are growing in Christ. We are here for that, that Christ would be formed in us and that we would see his glory throughout the nations. So again, we are turning back to, guess, guess what book? Just guess. The book of John. All right, you guys have been here. John 15, and we're going to start with verse 18. And to remind us what's happening in this section, this is when Jesus is with his disciples. And these are some of his final words to them, preparing them for what was to come. And if you had someone in your life who has passed away, those weeks or those days or those hours or those minutes sometimes are the most precious as they are communicating to us perhaps what is most on their heart, things that they want to tell us or leave with us or things that they're asking us to do. If you have had, again, family or friends that you know this is the case, I think back to when my father passed away about uh, 14 years ago. I was able to spend some time with him, uh, right? He was in hospice, is getting ready to uh, to to um, end this life. Um, He told me a few things that have stuck with me. Number one is to be to spend and be spent for the glory of God. He says, make sure you focus on that. He told me, he said, there's storms all, all around, and often there are storms, but try to keep in the center of those storms and trust that the Lord will be with you. He also charged me to make sure that you take care of the family. Try to have them be together. Watch out for them. Look over them. And then he prayed for me and he blessed me. In similar ways, Jesus in this passage and in this section is communicating vital truth to those he loves the dearest and closest, those disciples who've been with him for his last three years of ministry, who've been in thick and thin, who had celebrations, who had uh, difficulties. And he's saying, guys, come here. There's some things on my heart that I want to communicate to you. And we've seen this even last week that says, hey, you have to abide in me. You have to be connected to me. But Apart from my spirit, apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from me, you can do nothing. He encouraged them to love each other, to love each other over and over and over again. And preparing them in that way, he also told them some things that were difficult. He told them, do not let your hearts be troubled. And then he went on and told them some very troubling things that expect to be hated, expect to be harmed, but also in the middle of that, expect to be helped. And so as we look at this passage and we look at these words, we are reminded that we have to be connected to Christ in our loving obedience and following after Him, and we must be connected to each other in love. But Christianity is all, just not all kumbaya and campfires, okay? Sometimes it is costly. Sometimes it is difficult. Sometimes there is a price to pray. Jesus knew these things. He was going to pay the ultimate price in within about 12 hours or so, giving his life. And he knew that they too were going to be 
persecuted, that they were going to be harmed, that they were going to be hated. And he wanted to prepare them for these things, saying, hey, guys, let me tell you what's going to happen, okay? As you are loving each other, as you are representing me, as my gospel goes throughout the world, as I am changing lives by my spirit, through my word, because of what I've done, you are carrying this message forward. And everywhere you go, some people will listen to you and speak to them. And there are others who will oppose you for various reasons. So don't be surprised when the world hates you. Don't be surprised when people try to harm you. Don't be surprised of these things. I'm telling you this now, this is what Jesus said, so that your faith would not fail, that you would be strengthened, that you would be equipped, that you would be empowered to represent me in the world. And so this is what Jesus was preparing his disciples for, so their faith would not fail. So this is our passage today. So this is John chapter 15, starting in verse 18. And Jesus again tells them three things they are to expect. They are indeed expected to be hated. We're going to see this. Then they're to be expected to be helped by the Holy Spirit. And they're going to be harmed. And so we're going to look at those three points from this passage. And in that, I want your heart to be open. This morning, as most Sunday mornings, well, all Sunday mornings, we pray for this room. We pray for what happens here. My hope is that already that you have been helped. My hope is already that you've heard the voice of Christ, that you will be encouraged by the voices of those around us. You'll be encouraged by the music, encouraged by the invitation. And my hope is that our hearts will be open, that we could hear the voice of the Spirit through His printed Word. So, as He gathered these men around, He says, here, listen guys, now I want you to also understand and expect to be hated. This is John 15, verse 18. Jesus then said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me First, in this section, we're going to see why they are to anticipate hatred and why we have to anticipate anticipate being hated as well. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Now, you would think that Jesus would have been loved and received everywhere he went, right? He was the miracle worker. He fed people multitudes of people. He was the freer of demons, right? People who were plagued by these evil spirits. He spoke a word and they were set free. He opened the eyes of the blind as the gentle healer, healing sicknesses, even raising the dead. You would think that every person would embrace Jesus, right? Be hated? Why should we anticipated being hated? And he says, well, if the world hates you, keep in mind, he hated me first. And there were people who, even though Jesus did all of these miraculous things, hated him. Not necessarily for what he did, but what it meant about who he was and what he spoke about. The sinfulness of our hearts and the sinfulness of the world. He said that its works were evil. Kent Hughes, who has written, he's a pastor, has written many commentaries. He wrote one on John. He said these words as an illustration. He said this, Jesus' life, specifically through his words and his works, demonstrated by contrast how sinful And that time, the Jews were, or we are. And they hated him for that. His inner righteousness drew their abiding hostility because it revealed, right? Because of his great glory, it revealed their hatred or their issues, their shabbiness of their external goodness. As an illustration, he says this, He said, once there was an African chief, in this case a woman, happened to visit a mission uh, station. 
Now, hanging outside the missionary's cabin, on a tree, there was a little mirror. The chief happened to look into the mirror and saw her reflection. It was with hideous paint and evil features. She gazed at her own terrifying countenance and jumped back in horror, exclaiming, Who is that horrible-looking person inside that tree? Oh, the missionary said, it's not in the tree. The glass is reflecting your own face. The African would not believe it until she held the mirror in her hand. She said, I must have this glass. How much will you sell it for? The missionary said, I don't want to sell it. But this person begged until she gave in, capitulated. She took the mirror, exclaiming, I will never have it making faces at me again. (laughs) Threw it down and broke it to pieces. That's precisely what the Jews did with Jesus. And looking into him, they saw the ugliness of their own hearts. Instead of dealing with their own hearts and recognizing that there's sin that is distorting God's image and gone less than God's perfection. Instead of dealing with the reflection that they saw in the face of Christ, they decided to kill Christ. Get rid of him. Because his righteousness reminded them and reminds us that our works are evil. Know that if the world hates you because you are reflecting Jesus, you're in good company. Because the world hated Jesus first. So ultimately, the hatred towards you is hatred towards Christ, as long as you're reflecting Christ. By the way, if you're hated because you're a jerk, that's on you, right? (laughs) They're persecuting me because I'm a Christian. No, they're persecuting you because you're lazy, because you're rude, you're irritable. Okay? There's a difference between being hated. It says the world here, right? I'm not talking, when you think of the world, we think of all the secular world. <laughs> the Jews, by the way, were very religious people, right? right? Without Christ. Right? He says, listen. If you're in me, and you're walking in me, and people hate you because when they see you, they're reminded of Christ, and when they're reminded of Christ, they see that, oh man, there are some things in me that aren't good, and instead of dealing with their heart, they tried to kill you, harm you. He said, boys, men and women, I remind you that they hated me first, right? So expect that you will be Hated. Now it gave them a second reason. It gave them a second reason. It gives us a second reason why the world hatred comes to those who follow Christ. Verse 19. John said, if Jesus said, if you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is. You do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That's why. The world hates you. This, by the way, is called tribalism, right? There's two teams, right? And some of you who are um, football fans, anybody football fans here? Go Chiefs. Go Bears. I heard the Bears. A lot of Bears fans around here. I'm a football fan as well, okay? And I'll take, well, I, I see someone, Mark, why don't you stand up, buddy? Stand up, buddy. Stand up. Just observe, just observe the colors here. <laughs> People are laughing, they're laughing. Okay. So I know as a, as a Vikings fan in a, in a hostile environment of, of Bears fans and some <clears throat> other fans, um, I know when I see someone wearing a, a Vikings shirt, right, we're automatically friends. Right, I don't care. This is seriously when we're walking around and we're like Casco and stuff like that. We see another Vikings fan. We're like, "Hey, what's up?" Right, and we start talking. 
We start talking about the team. We start talking about, you know, our players. We start talking about Justin Jefferson. We start talking about, oh, all these injuries. And then we have a commonality because we have a common value, right? We're like, oh, we're buddies, right? <laughs> and we have a common hate, right? We all hate the Packers. Where, where's Tim? Where's Tim? Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, there you are. I see you up there, buddy. I see you. I see you. Because we know when we see the colors, right, this is our people. We cheer for the same things. We have the same values. We're connected. We have the same things that we hate, right? On this planet, <laughs> there are people who are for Jesus, and then there's everybody else, right? Now, no, check this out, right? So Jesus was saying to us, says, hey, listen, you're part of the world, you're playing for one team, but I've called you out to be on my team, right? You are, once were a part of the kingdom of darkness, but now you are a part of the kingdom of light. Changes our values, changes our heart, connects us in unity towards him. And so when the world encounters Christ, encounters Christians, there's an automatic animosity between the two. Because what the world values is not what Jesus values typically. Right? Those in the world or whatever, they'll celebrate. In particular, there's hatred when it comes to sexual ethics these days. Hot topic, right? Celebrate, man, I slept with 30 people. Should we like, oh, way to go. I'm not happy for that. The world embraces those who are embracing um, things like homosexuality, okay? And they expect us to applaud that. I applaud those who are abstaining. The world has a value of trying to get as much money and take advantage. Oh, you couldn't believe, man, at work today. Like, I hid in the bathroom for six hours. I showed them. Oh, way to go. You're awesome. Well, I was in the back room on my cell phone all day. Oh, man, I wish I could do that as well. I, I'm not part of that team. Shouldn't you be working? <laughs> Aren't they paying you for that? Or look how much money I've gathered to myself, right? The question is not how much money you've gathered to yourself, but the real question is, I applaud those who, how much money they've given away. <laughs> how much have you, you've given away? So we have to understand that we are called to follow Jesus. It is countercultural to our society. And Jesus gets more specific, and we'll see this as other people are following other gods. There's a tension there. And Jesus says, hey, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own, right? Because you'd be celebrating the same things. You'd be cheering the same teams. You'd be all about that. But now that I've selected you out of the world, I've chosen you out, now the world hates you. We define success differently. We cheer for different things, and there is tension there. And so Jesus told them, you're called to be different, called to follow me, to be a part of the kingdom of light, and these things happen. Perhaps you had some of this tension over Thanksgiving. I had some of this tension as well. Expect some of this. Now, Jesus goes on and gives us another reason why there is this hatred, and that's a strong word. This is in verse 20 of John chapter 15. Jesus then told them and tells us, remember what I told you. A servant is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will also obey yours. And if they resist my teaching, this is not there, but this is implied, they'll resist yours as well. Jesus was persecuted. 
So much so that he was tortured. So much so that he was made a spectacle. So much so he was spit on and his beard was ripped out. And he was nailed to a cross and suffered. He was opposed in various places. And his followers were opposed in various places as well. He's saying, hey, if you're my servant and I was persecuted, so you will be persecuted. You are guilty by association. Do you remember Peter? You remember Peter, the apostle? Remember what Jesus told him? Remember that? In the upper room, washing the feet. And like, hey, he's like, hey, I'm never going to deny you. He said, Peter, come here, come here. Not once, not twice. Three times. Why why did Peter deny his Savior, his Lord, the one who declared, you are are the Christ? Why? By a little servant girl, by the way. Hey, aren't you? Do you want to? Aren't you with Jesus? No, no, I I don't know. Why did he respond that way? It's fear. Fear what? Persecution. Isolation. Not being accepted to the group. Is fear a problem sometimes when our, with our association with Jesus? We don't, people want to know, so we're afraid, so we don't say anything. Have you ever done that? I've done it. You're a pastor. Yeah, I'm a human as well, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, I don't, I don't want them to know I love Jesus that much, so I'm just kind of keeping it on the down low. Because if they don't like me, because I want to be like. So the question is, do you want to, would you rather honor God or would you rather be liked by people? That, that's hard sometimes, guys. This is not easy. It's, we read it and say, oh yeah, that's, you know, yeah, for sure. But when it comes to it, it's difficult. <laughs> He's saying, hey, listen, I'm your master. If you say Jesus is Lord, okay, He's Savior, yes, saving you from your sin, but He's also your Lord, right? He's your King. He's the one that you follow. He's the one that you take orders from, the ones that you say, your values are my values. Where you go, I want to go. What you do, I want to do. If you follow Him, if He's your master, that means you are following in line with Him. And if you do so, they hated Him. And because you're associated with Jesus, they're going to hate you. So just be ready for that. God, help us in our disassociation with Christ because we don't want to be injured, right? Blessed are those of you who, who suffer, right, for my sake. God, help our love for Christ to be greater than forgive you, that your friends, quote unquote, will ever give you, your coworkers, your classmates. And you think, well, I'm not going to be persecuted, right? This flies in the face of the modern-day American Western prosperity gospel that says if you're drawing close to Jesus, you will have all things roses and plums and puddings and wonderful things. Will you get some of those? Absolutely. But this says, hey, if you're close to Jesus, and they talked about this truth over and over and over again. We have their letters, right, who wrote... First and Second Corinthians and Thessalonians and most of the New Testament is focusing in on at places things like this to this early church who is suffering for Christ. They said stuff like this. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? Prospered. Oh wait, persecuted. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. I hope that's you. Do you desire this? Takes his Holy Spirit us. But if you desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted. Just be ready for this. Philippians chapter 1. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Granted, right? A gift to suffer because of your belief in Him. Understand it as an honor. First Thessalonians chapter 3. 
Paul is talking to this young church and said, hey, I'm sending you Timothy, who was a pastor, who was an elder, who was a co-worker. He's going to be there in, in helping to spread the gospel, but to strengthen you and to encourage you in the faith, and this is verse 3, 1 Thessalonians 3, 3, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are, what's the word? Oh, you read, you read, okay, that's good. You does it for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that way as you well know. Right? If you're following Christ, right? if you're in the context of the world, right? we'll define the world as those who do not believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Expect resistance. This is there, 1 Peter chapter 4, dear friends, this is Peter writing, do not be surprised, and he was reinstated by the way, okay, he felt the pressure, and we'll see that at the end of John, okay, he knew what it was to be, uh, have people come against him, he died as a martyr, this is the apostle Peter, he was writing to a church saying, dear friends, to the church I should say, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are what? Blessed. Sometimes blessings come through the teardrops. For the Spirit of glory and of God rests. That's powerful. It's helpful. He helps us. Jesus gave us, then again, another reason why Christians should expect to be hated. It's because of, again, who Jesus is. This is John chapter 15, verse 21 through 25. He says, now, listen, guys. Listen, men. Listen, women. They will treat you this way. Because of my name. You catch that? By the way, the world is okay with people being religious to a degree, being spiritual for sure, or having faith in God. The issue comes when the name of Jesus is brought up. They would treat you this way because of my name. Did you catch that? A lot of religions in the world believe in God. But when you talk about Jesus, it becomes very specific, where it becomes very narrow. As Jesus said, he is what? The way, the truth, and the life. And then he said, no one comes to the Father yet through me. So people will treat you this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. And if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. We have the revealed word of God. People do not have excuse for their sin. No one is ignorant. Right? Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If he had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated me and my father. But this is to fulfill what was written in their laws. They hated, in the law, they hated me without reason. Right? This is serious. This is costly. Right? There are people in this world, and Jesus addresses it, and we'll see it in just a little bit, right? who hate Christians because of Christ. By the way, Christianity, or being called a Christian, you know what it has in it? Christ. Right? Well, I'm spiritual. You better be more than spiritual. You better be in Christ. Right? Well, I believe in a God. <laughs> Which one?
well, we love God, but we don't like Jesus. Is there any religions this day that has that issue? Yeah. I can name you a lot. I'll name a couple. Islam. They love God, but they don't like Jesus. Who else? Judaism, by the way. They're not Messianic Jews. Rejected Jesus. Hindus believe that Jesus is one of the gods. Not the God, right? It's a God among a lot of them. And Jesus was saying, listen, if you hate me, if you don't receive me, you don't receive the Father as well. Do you understand this? Come on, hear me. This is super unpopular in our day. They're okay with you, you know, practicing your religion, but people are not okay with you saying Jesus is the way. That's really controversial. So does that mean then that I'm going to be separated from God in eternity, that I would be in a place that Jesus talked about? Hades, hell, Jesus talked about that. He talked about that more than anyone else, by the way, in the New Testament. Jesus is the way. Now, the good news is that everyone can come to the Father, but they do it through whom? Jesus. That's why there's power in his name. That's why he praise his name. That's why his name is greater than any other name. If you claim Christ, Christ claims you, chooses you out of the world. There is a connection. But there also is resistance. Jesus came to provide grace away to the Father, and he said, hey, they hated me without reason. By the way, this is in the Psalm, Psalm 35, Psalm uh, 90, excuse me, 69 talks about this. David was saying they hated me without reason, David being a type of Christ, okay? And if they hated David, they're going to hate the real thing, Christ, all the more. Came to help, came to heal, came to provide a way of forgiveness, to wash us clean, Christ, you have to recognize that you need Christ. In order to recognize you need Christ, you have to understand that you are, you're you're evil. (laughs) Well, I'm not evil. I'm mostly good. Would you eat a pan of brownies with just a little bit of mud in it? It's mostly good. All of us are trespassers, trespassers, law breakers. We have a righteous and holy God who made a way for our forgiveness, who made a way for making us new, born again. They hated him without reason. So Jesus was saying that to his followers, which includes us. So expect to be hated because of your association with the name that is above all names. Embrace that. It's really okay. Well, I'm going to leave Christianity because my brothers don't like me. So what? This, by the way, happens. A lot. Well, I'm, I'm tired of taking these stances, so I'm just going to embrace what the world embraces so that I'm going to be light. How long is your life compared to eternity, by the way? Okay, you guys have done the math. What's more important? Jesus is telling them that. He's telling us this. Second is this. Expect to be helped. This is the good news, Right? Expect to be helped. So Jesus told them, hey, you guys are going to be hated because of your connection with me. They hated me. They're going to hate you. 
right? Just expect this, but also I'm going to give you a helper, right? John 15, verse 26, he's talked, Jesus talked about it before. He's going to talk about it again. We're going to look at it next week. It says, when the advocate comes, right, the one who supports us, the one who defends us, the spirit of truth, when the advocate comes and he sent the Holy Spirit to be here in this even room right now, in our hearts right now, if you're a believer, when the advocate comes, who well, I'll send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, convicts people that Jesus is the Christ, confronts them with, with the truth of what is written about him. And we know from what is created, we know what is in our heart, we know from specific revelation of what Jesus said, what is his, written in the Bible. And so the Holy Spirit says, yeah, 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 he is the Christ, testifying to his glory. He helps us to give witness in the truth of what we're saying. We say, amen, God, thank you for that. We're not alone, you're not abandoned, God's Spirit lives in you, helping you encouraging you, convicting you, drawing you, empowering you to bring testimony about Jesus as the Son of God, right? You understand that, right? He says, I'm giving you this helper, right? He testifies about me, and you also must testify. For I've been with me from the beginning, this is bringing testimony of what Jesus has done in your life. Has Jesus done anything in your life? Right? What has he done? Right? Thanksgiving is a great time, not just to give thanks for our material blessings, but to give thanks for our eternal blessings. Right? Right? Save me from the wrath of God, which is due me because of my sin. He's forgiven me. He's giving me some self-control that helps me to stay away from things that are going to cause me problems. He's given me hope in the midst of storm. He's given me power to continue to persevere. He's given me everything I need for life and godliness. I thank him for those things. It's just testifying what you've seen in Christ and what he's done for you. Guess what? You can do that. Well... I need to go to seminary. You don't. Unschooled and trained ordinary men, right? What was different about these guys? They've been with Jesus. Jesus, what are you doing? Where are you going? What's happening? Talk about it. The Holy Spirit will help you. Look for opportunities. Look for places to talk about, here's the word, Jesus. You have to go beyond, well, I thank God. Right? The Muslims thank God, by the way. Are you hearing me? Jesus, I thank you for what I have in you. This is what Christ has done in my life. Jewish people, they thank God. Holy Spirit helps us to give testimony about Christ. Right? He's given us the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus then told them and tells us that there's some other hard things. Not only are we expected to be hated, we can expect to be helped. But we're also to expect to be harmed. And following Christ may even cost you your life. And if I was in Saudi Arabia saying, saying this message, people would be glued in because they know all about that. Or various places in this planet. America, hmm, maybe not, Right? But this happens. Expect to be harmed. This is John chapter 16 up to verse 4. Jesus said, all this I have told you. Why? 
So you will not fall away. This is the reason why he's telling us this way thing. This is the reason that it's in Scripture. This is the reason why we're talking about it today, because it should help your faith, knowing that these things will happen so that you will not fall away. We'll talk about them. They will put you out of the synagogue. Okay, these were the Jewish boys right in the beginning. Push you out of their community. This was a big deal. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father and they have not known me. Now, I've told you this so that when their time comes, you remember that I warned you about them. Now, notice what Jesus did not say in this passage. He did not say, I have told you these things so that you will not be harmed or killed. He didn't say that. What he said was, all this I've told you so that you will not fall away, which means that Jesus is more concerned about your faith than your fate. Okay. Jesus was more concerned about their denial than he was about their death. Put this in perspective. Right? Looking in eternity, what matters most is not that if you die, but if you have faith, because you will die. Right? The death rate hovers around 100%. Right? Hovering there. Right? You are going to die, but you will live eternally. The question is not, well, I hope you don't die. The question is, will you persevere? Will you continue to hold on to Christ? Will you continue to draw close to Him? D.A. Carson, who was a theologian, said this. He observed that the greatest dangers the disciples will confront from the opposition of the world was not death, but apostasy, that is, falling away. Which means your faith and your faithfulness are more valuable than even your life here on earth. The greatest danger is not death, but falling away from Jesus. Right? Get this in perspective, right? If you lose your life for my sake, you will gain it. Jesus told them, this is in Luke chapter 12, he says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body. And after that, and after that, have nothing more that they can do. All they can do is kill you. Right? Don't be afraid of dying for your faith. Right? But if you're going to be afraid of something, I want to warn you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has been killed, has authority cast into hell. Jesus said this, by the way. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Right? Do we love God? Yes. But we also respect God, and there is a fear. We often just paint God as, you know, or Christ as this, uh, I don't know, some weak-willed, just, oh, it's okay, like your grandmother. God is not your grandmother. Even though your grandmother might be really awesome. Oh, it's okay. God is loving, yes, but He's also just. God is forgiving, yes, but He's also holy. There is significant reward and there's significant loss. For eternity, saying, hey, listen, even if they come against you, all they can do to you, the worst they can do to you is kill you. So bring it. Have you read Hebrews chapter 11? Any of you guys read this? You should read it. All of these were commended for their faith. They lost homes, they lost families, they were destitute, they were killed, some were sawed in half. He says the world was not 
worthy of them. This is important. Right? Our eternal destination is more important than our temporal condition. Remember that. Remember that. And our brothers and sisters in other countries face this as a contemporary reality. Asian Access, which is a group that works in Asia, Christian mission agencies in South Asia, listed a series of questions that some church planners there ask new believers as they're getting ready for their baptism, right? Baptism, a public demonstration of an inward faith. It says, all right, they come to Christ. They said, all right, now you're going to get baptized. This is a public expression that you're saying that you connected, belong to, dead in Christ, be raised with him. You're saying to the world that you're a Christian. Now, are you ready when you are to do this? Let me ask you a couple questions. Number one, are you willing to leave home and lose the blessing of your father? Because this may incur that. Are you willing for that? Are you willing to lose your job? Other places, if they find out that you're a Christian, you will be kicked out of your house. You will lose your employment. Are you willing to lose that? Are you willing to go to the village and those who persecute you, forgive them and share your love of Christ with them. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to give an offering to the Lord to may mean your life? Are you willing to be beaten rather than deny your faith? Are you willing to go to prison? Are you willing to die for Jesus? We have to understand that. Jesus, by the way, is not, and Christianity is not an American religion. It is the religion to the whole world. There are more believers in other countries than they are in America. By the way, often the church does much better in persecution than it does in prosperity. Put that in your prosperity pipe and smoke it. <laughs> Hear me. Because you have, if there's a cost, you have to say, yes, I'm willing to pay. Jesus is greater than. <laughs> greater than. And in places, this is what they have to face. Jesus said that we'd be persecuted because of him. That we'd be pushed out because of belief in him. And we understand that to some degree in our culture. Some will kill Christians thinking that by doing so, they're offering a service to God. That was certainly the case. And remember this in 2015? Right? 21 Coptic Christians, Christians were beheaded, videotaped by ISIS. You remember that? Right? Those people who were beheading the Christians right, thought that they were offering a service to God. Allah in this case. That's what they thought. And Jesus said, hey, hey, there's going to be people that believe this. Don't be surprised. Dr. Todd M. Johnson, professor of global Christianity and missions at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and their team, they estimated that more than 70 million Christians, 70, it's like mind-boggling, how do you get your mind around that? 70 million Christians have been martyred over the last two millennia, okay, Christ until now, 70 million have been killed because of Christ. And more than half of which died in the 20th century, recently, under fascism and communist regimes. They also estimate that 1 million Christians were killed between 2001 and 2010. And about 900,000 were killed from 2011 to 20. That's a lot of people. People would rather <laughs> die for Christ and then rather do that than live on this world. Blaise Pascal, who was a theologian, mathematician, physicist, and philosopher, lived in the 1600s. During his time, he observed and said this, Men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction. 
If you're saying, Dave, what are you talking about? I don't know, I don't know anybody. Well, you live in America, right? You probably don't. Maybe you do. I want to encourage you to read books like The Fox's Book of Martyrs. Do you know this book? Go to Amazon or wherever you buy your books. The library, thank you. Whoa, go to the library, it's right down the hall. Read. Be educated, right? Go to the library. Sign up, you know, read a book, Torture for Christ. Anyone read this book? S several of us? Okay. It will encourage you, it will challenge you, and this just happened in Romania, right? Founder of an organization called Voice of the Martyrs. You can sign up for this, get their newsletter, that will come, comes into my inbox, okay, once a month, and you can read about what's going on. Other places like um, Mission Network News that you need to take a look at so you know what's happening around the world. I put all the links in your notes. These things happen. And Jesus said in, in this section, it says, people who persecute and kill followers of Jesus who are Christians in the name of their God don't know God the Father at all. And they don't know Jesus as well. Those are strong words, right? This is not a popular message, by the way. I would not be invited to the White House. Please pray for us because you are accepting of all religions. There's some religions that are true and some religions that are false. What? What do they have to center in? Jesus. If you want to know what a religion really believes, ask them Ask it about Jesus. What do they think of Jesus? If they think anything less than he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, right? They're not true. Hear me. It's important. Most people are okay with spirituality, but they, mm, well, they like Jesus when he tells us, you know, to be nice, right? But when he says he's the way, the truth, and the life, hmm. When he says, oh, you need a, you know, you're, you're evil, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Who said that? Jesus. That was actually the first line that can come out of his mouth, according to most of the Gospels. <laughs> repent. That's the first thing he said. For the kingdom of God is near. That is when he was preaching, which means a lot. Right? All right. We're going to land this plane. Got my friend conclusion. <laughs> so we read this passage. What does it mean for us, right? I have some questions, by the way. If you're part of a small group, well, I encourage you to be part of a growth group, excuse me. If you're not one, I would encourage you to do it. Put in questions on the bottom. If you're part of the group, perhaps you'll talk about these or you can think about them on your own. They're here. So here's the thing. Following Jesus has a cost. Right? It cost Jesus, right? He left heaven. <laughs> That's a cost, right? Jesus is worthy of the cost. And he is more valuable than any pleasure this world has to offer or any pain you must endure. He is worth it. Right? So knowing that, well, then how should we pray? You know, what do we do, right? So should we pray for protection? Guess what the answer is? Yeah. Well, how do you know that? Well, just flip over the page. Yeah, we're going to get there. This is John chapter 17 where Jesus prays for his disciples. He prays for the world. He prays for us. He does say, protect them from the evil one. So should we pray for protection? Sure, absolutely pray for it. And, and perhaps more importantly, not only do we pray for protection, we pray for perseverance. Pray that the faith will not fail. This is what we pray for because that's more important even if you get caught, even if you are on your knees in a beach in the Mediterranean, keep the faith because that is more valuable even than your earthly life on earth. So we pray for protection, sure, but we pray most importantly for perseverance. Right? We pray, God, help us not to be intimidated or scared because of some type of separation or persecution or people may not like you. 
God, help us to be bold, bold, testi- uh, bold to give bold testimony about Christ. God, help us to do that. May God give you that boldness. I'm going to pray that when, we, when we're done here. God will give you that boldness. Say, well, I'm not that bold for Christ. Well, do you know? How do you know Him? Right? If you know Him, you love Him more. The more you know Him, the more you love Him. So in order to get bold, you have to get close to Christ. Right? So instead of, oh, I don't want to be afraid. No, you focus on Christ and He will give you the love and the power to have a witness. That's the key. <laughs> so we're going to pray for that. And then pray, be educated about what's happening in the world. Yes, tell people about Christ in your neighborhood. Why do you think you're here in Rockford? Well, I make cars. For Christ? Do you make them for Christ? Aren't you here for Christ ultimately? All the cars in this world are going to rust. Why do you think you're here to testify about Christ? Don't be surprised that the world hates Christians, and this will continue to happen. When it is dark, this is when the light matters most and shines brightest, so shine. Well, I'm afraid that they're going to persecute me. So what? Well, I want people to be nice to me. (laughs) Okay. I'd rather be associated with Christ, be hated, versus being liked and distanced from Christ. So may we have that boldness, okay? I'm going to pray for us. Um, if you need prayer for anything, there will be people here, always here, after service here. Pray, pray, pray for anything, whatever it is, or there. And so let's pray, and then we'll conclude with song. <clears throat> so Jesus, we, we're here. You know <laughs> that we're here. We gather together in your name this your body. Jesus, you gave us courage, you gave us comfort, you gave us your spirit, you gave us your very word, you gave us new life, you've given us hope, you've given us everything. And we indeed give you the utmost thanks and we praise you. And Jesus, we also recognize that you prepared us for things that would happen, that the world those who do not claim Christ as their king will hate and harm those who have harnessed themselves to you. So God, I ask, Father, that yes, of course, you will protect us from the evil one or from evil And I pray for that, for this congregation, I pray for that. For those in the world who are suffering horrifically, even this very moment throughout the world. I pray that you would protect them, that you would watch over them. God, even more important, we pray that their faith would not fail. That they would persevere in the midst of hardship and harm and hatred. And I pray for us, God, that you would help us us to be bold in giving testimony about you, to stand firm on the convictions that you reveal to us, the truth that is in your word, God, that we would stand true to these things, regardless of what the world says and those outside of Christianity says, God, that we would value you more than any other thing even in our own lives. So God, I ask that you would give us boldness, that we would be as gladly associated with you. Well, do that in this place, in this community, for our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends, our family. And we need help with this. And God, thank you that you've given us help. So thank you, Christ, that you were with us even to the ends of the age. Thank you, Christ, that you're preparing your bride when you 
return. Thank you, Christ, for not leaving us as orphans. Thank you, Christ, for what you've done in us. And we indeed praise you. Help us. Equip us. Encourage us. Strengthen us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.